Thank you, Elliot. Uh, when you when you give that figure, 200 million people have downloaded this this very important tool. It's just it's mind-boggling. Uh, my name is John Heffernan, and I am the director of the Genocide Prevention Initiative here at the museum. What we're about to see is what genocide looks like in Darfur. I've seen it with my own eyes. I lived in Sudan for two years, and then I've been to Darfur three times in the last few years. I think it's important to really understand what's happened in Darfur by, by giving some historical perspective. Uh, first of all, Sudan is the largest country in Africa. When we lived there, people used to put it in, in, in sort of U.S. perspective and say it would be like taking the Mississippi and going east. So from the Mississippi east is the size of Sudan. Darfur itself, the westernmost province, is the size of Texas, a huge swath of land. There's been historic marginalization, political, economic, social, um, those people living in Darfur from the capital of Khartoum, which is about a thousand miles away. There's been complex historic tension between the non-Arab farmers and the, the Arab uh, herders all vying for the same piece of land. This land that is continuing to get smaller and smaller as the Sahel, the southern part of the Sahara Desert, moves southward. In 2003, rebel forces, frustrated with this marginalization, took up arms and invaded the fortification in El Fashir, which is the provincial capital of North Darfur. In response, the government, working with the proxy forces, the Janjaweed, have targeted non-Arab civili civilians, primarily represented by the Zagawa, Four, and Mazalit tribes. And today, since the winter of 2003, over 2.5 million people have lost their homes. Hundreds of thousands have died. Over 1,600 villages that we're about to see have been destroyed. This is a genocide, a slow genocide. This is a genocide by attrition, not like Rwanda where, in thir where 13 years ago, in a period of 100 days, over 800,000 people were systematically murdered. Here people are dying slowly. More people are dying from disease and starvation than actual violence. And I'll tell you why. When I met with the people of Darfur in my three trips there, I asked them, how was their village destroyed? And consistently they would tell me about some sort of aerial assault followed by a, a ground assault whereby the Janjaweed on horseback and on camel, working in concert in an integrated fashion with the government of Sudan, would enter the village, go from house to house, loot everything of value, carpets, beds, livestock. And then if the men resisted, they were killed, and if the women resisted, they were raped. And then the people that survived were thrust, were driven out into this desert death trap. People historically have built complex coping mechanisms to survive in this harsh desert. But if you don't have anything of value, if everything that sustains you has been removed, then you're going to die. And this is what's happening in Darfur. We refer to it in the Genocide Convention, there's, a, there's an article, article 2C, that talks about inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about the destruction of a certain group of people. This is what's happening in Darfur. And today, the security situation is so bad that humanitarian organizations cannot do their job. And these people in camps, and those people who are not, who are not in camps, must rely on this outside assistance. And again, this assistance has been systematically blocked by the government in Sudan. And now, the genocide is bleeding into Chad and the Central African Republic. The museum's chief information officer, Lawrence Swader, is about to show you the scope and systematic destruction of villages in Darfur. This destruction has, has certainly destroyed, has destroyed villages, but it's also destroyed lives and livelihoods. Larry. Thank you, John. I work with John, so I hear those stories often, and 
the, the kind of stories I'm inspired really on a daily basis to use technology for to get the word out and um, help prevent genocide and end it in the case of Darfur. Good morning. Welcome to the museum, which you can see clearly here, courtesy of Google Earth. Today I'm presenting something that was just a seed of an idea nearly two years ago when Google Earth was born. Then a team of volunteers wondered how this application, this new application, could be used to make the world a better place. Today, through this unique partnership, every Google Earth user worldwide will automatically see a preview of information that shows the destruction in Darfur, and you can see that outlined there on the map of Africa. By bringing together high-resolution satellite imagery, data, and photos into a program accessible to the world, Google Earth allows us to see something that could have gone unseen. This technology allows us to visualize information in seconds or minutes that otherwise might take pages of text or columns of figures to understand, if ever. We are providing the general public, policymakers, and relief workers from all over the world a new resource for seeing this information. Clicking on the icon here in the middle brings up a balloon where you can download more photos, maps, and testimonies and get a complete view of the, of the destruction. And when you do that, it will load over here into the side bar. And I'm going to turn on those layers so you can see it. Users will see the destruction through these layers of content gathered from organizations that include the State Department, the UN, and NGOs like Amnesty International and Physicians for Human Rights. This map shows more than 1,600 villages throughout Darfur that have been partially or completely destroyed, comprising more than 130,000 homes, schools, mosques, and other structures throughout Darfur. The yellow icons that you can see using the legend on the left, the yellow icons represent damaged villages and the red are destroyed. I'll turn this off to give you a better view. In Darfur, as John said, an area roughly the size of Texas, thousands of structures like this, the one on the left, round mud homes with grass roofs from 10 to 20 feet wide, had been systematically destroyed by Sudanese government soldiers and their proxy militias. This is an example of what's left in their wake. And I show this to you now because we're going to be zooming in on high resolution satellite imagery uh, in, in villages that have been destroyed and damaged. And you're going to see these structures. You'll see them, they'll be represented by hollowed blackened circles on the ground, um, usually without their without the roof intact at all. And I'll point those out to you when we get there. 